2 Timothy. In just a moment. The Vacation Bible School theme is Breaker Rock Beach. I believe that's what the shirt says. Breaker Rock Beach. The Breaker Rock part is just an illustration. This part here, which because of my jacket, you can't see it very well, says God's truth never changes. <clears throat> Jesus told a story one time about a wise man and a foolish man. You remember that story, don't you? Jesus said that there's a difference between wise people and foolish people. This is the way he said it. He said, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Now, of course, he would go on to say that the foolish person is the person who hears the words but doesn't do them. And I think there's a strong correlation there between believing and doing. In other words, the person who believes the word is the person who will do it. I believed that my van would get me to Missouri. You know, I proved it too, didn't I? I got in that van and I drove it all the way across through a tornado on, on one particular Saturday morning. I didn't realize, I'm not that stupid, I didn't know there was going to be a tornado. Found out later, that's what we were going through. We believe things every day that we end up proving. You believe that the bench that you're sitting on will hold you, so you sit on it. You believe that your oven will cook your food, so you put it in there and then you turn it on. The Bible says that the wise person is the one who hears the words of God and does them. And VBS this year began with this lesson, truth, right there. By just truth comes from God. You know, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When Pilate was staring at the truth and asking, what is truth? What a foolish person. Right? Jesus said, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So not only is Jesus the truth, but the Word is the truth. And that tells us that there's a very special relationship between the Word of God that you hold in your lap or in your pocket when you go home and the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. This Word is the revelation, the revealing of Jesus Christ. If you want to know more about Jesus, Read the Bible. And I'm not talking just about the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Obviously, you can read about the words that he said while he was on the earth, the things that he did, the things that were done to him when you read those four books. But did you know that when you read the book of Genesis, you're also reading about Jesus Christ? When you read the laws of Moses, you're still reading about Jesus Christ. This is what drives me crazy when people say, Oh, Jesus never said that we couldn't do this. And I'm saying, well, does it say it in the Old Testament? Well, yeah. Well, then Jesus said it. Because Jesus is the truth, and the Word is the truth, so there's this special connection. But we live in a culture that doesn't believe that anymore. We live in a culture that has fallen 
for the lie, for the, the psyop that began all the way back in the Garden of Eden. As God said. <coughs> Remember those famous words that the serpent said to Eve in the Garden of Eden? Has God said, did he really say this? And boy, we see it all around the stone. Has God really said that there are only two genders? Has God really said that marriage should be for a man and a woman? Has God really said that marriage ought to be for life and you shouldn't just chuck it when you get tired of the other person? Has God, and this is a big one in our society right now, has God really said that children are a blessing and to be sought after and loved? Has God really said that working hard honors Him? Has God really said that honoring parents is expected of children? Has God really said that a godly man will take care of his family? These are things we take for granted. But in our culture, all of these values are being turned upside down and subverted. Why? Or how, I guess I should ask. It's because they're asking, did God really say that? And some people will come back and say, well, and I saw this on a video the other day. Oh, the Bible has been rewritten and translated so many times, we can't know what it really says. You ever heard that? Oh, the Bible has been translated from so many different languages and down throughout history, we can't know what it really says. And they say, it's like the old game Telephone. You all remember that game, don't you? If I start over here with Ren and I whisper, the, what would I whisper? I don't know. <laughs> I caught myself on the spot here. The, uh, huh? In the, the beginning. The Cowboys are going to win this year. <laughs> That's bound to get twisted. The Cowboys are going to win the Super Bowl in 2024-25. And I start with Ren, and he goes to Amy, and he goes to Lisa, and he goes all the way around the room, and I give up a good bill, and it says, your grandma has stinky feet, or something stupid. Because that's just how it goes. And people say, that's the way the Bible is. Don't you see? <coughs> but that's not true, guys. I want to, if you have a Bible with you, I want you to hold it up real quick. I want to make a point about it, if you have it with you. This Bible is written in English. I'm assuming, unless you happen to have one written in another language. But did you know that it was not translated? You can put it down now. I should make you hold it up the rest of the service. See, see if who would bring it down first. It was translated from original sources. Did you know that we have the Greek New Testament? The New Testament was not written in English. It wasn't written in Latin. It was written in Greek. And we have the Greek New Testament almost certainly as it was originally inspired by God. And that means when people translate it into English, it's not going through a thousand permutations. It is going through one Greek to English. And we have the same thing in the Old Testament. We have Old Testament manuscripts that go back thousands of years. And it hasn't been translated a million times. It's not like the game Telephone. When you play Telephone... You start with one written phrase. But if I did it like this, if I wrote down the, the phrase and I gave it to Ren, the Cowboys will win the Super Bowl this year, and then it gets over here to Bill and says, your grandma has stinky feet, we could then compare it. The, what does it in fact say? The Cowboys won the Super Bowl. Um, will win. Will win. Future tense. I know. Important. And that's important because our text says that God has left us <coughs> something written down. Look at verse 16. 2 Timothy 3 and 16. All Scripture. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, 
Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Matthew, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, then Matthew, all the way to Revelation, all Scripture. What does he say? <coughs> is breathed out, inspired by God. It is as if God spoke the words himself. You can trust the Bible. Has God said? Yes, he has. Not only has God said, not only do we have a reliable scripture that is translated from first generation sources, we have prophecies in the Old Testament that can only be true of Jesus Christ. I, I want to say this. The last word of the Old Testament, what was the last book of the Old Testament? Malachi. The last word of the Old Testament was written at least 400 years before Jesus was born. Our country isn't even 400 years old yet. Think about that. And yet, the Old Testament, which was compiled, some of it, 2,000 years before Jesus was born, contains at least, conservatively, 300 prophecies about a coming Messiah that were fulfilled by Jesus Christ. 300 prophecies. And you might say, what kind of prophecies are you talking about, preacher? Well, prophecies like this. The Messiah will be born in Bethlehem, Micah chapter 5. The Messiah will be born of a virgin, Isaiah chapter 7. The Messiah, this is very specific, will be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, Zechariah chapter 11. Was Jesus betrayed for 30 pieces of silver? Yes, he was. The Messiah will have murder attempted against him, Jeremiah chapter 31. The Messiah will be preceded by a messenger who was an awful lot like Elijah. Who was that? John the Baptist. Jesus fulfilled between 300 and 500 unique Old Testament prophecies. I, I want to give you an illustration of how incredible this is. Whenever I send a piece of mail to my parents, I send it to 9094, County Road 167, Carthage, Missouri, 64836. Now, every one of those data points is important. If I send it to 9094, County Road 167, Carthage, Missouri, 64836, Two five, guess what? It ain't getting there. It's going to get sorted a different direction. If I put Joplin, Missouri, 64836, it's not going to get there. If I put everything right except for their name, it probably isn't going to get there. Every point has to line up in order for mail to get to them. And we're only talking about seven or eight points of data. Jesus fulfilled over 300 data points that pointed to the Messiah. So we know it has to be him. So we know that this word that God inspired is reliable. You can take it to the bank. You know, that's a phrase that young people probably don't understand anymore. Take it to the bank. Us older folk know what it means. We don't write checks anymore. Well, maybe some of us do. Young people don't write checks anymore. That's one reason that we have to, at some point, begin, you know, initiate an electronic giving option here at the church. We have to. Because as young people join the church, they're not going to start writing checks early. That's not going to just magically start because we want them to. But in the old days, young people, a little history lesson. When you wrote a check, you could tell the person, you can take it to the bank. You know what that meant? I got the funds to cover it. Unfortunately, you go into a lot of stores, 
And it'll say, no checks accepted. Why? Because you can't take it to the bank because they don't have the money. It'll bounce like a rubber ball. The Word of God, though, has the funds. All these prophecies, all, all this history. I mean, think about what Psalm 22 says of Jesus. They will divide my garments among them a thousand years before he was on the cross. They pierced my hands and feet. David wrote that a thousand years before Christ. This word that we have in our hands is reliable. It is a rock that stands against the crashing waves of our world that are asking over and over again, has God really said this? And Satan wants you to question what God said. But you, my friend, must know this word. It is God's inspired word. Our text, 2 Timothy 3.16, teaches us that God breathed out his word. That is, he gave the prophets and apostles the ideas and the very words that he wanted them to write down. It's true that they may have been simply recording history. Whoever wrote 1 Kings was probably just writing down history, not aware that he was being inspired by God to do so. It's true that David may have just been writing songs to praise the Lord, unaware that God was inspiring him to write them down for our benefit. It's true that Solomon was probably just recording advice for his son in the book of Proverbs. Unaware that God was inspiring him to write it down so that we could have the same wisdom that he did. It's true that Ezekiel probably wrote down his prophecies of judgment against the people of Israel just because they needed to hear it. But he was unaware that God was inspiring him to write down all of those prophecies against judgment because he wanted us to know how much he hates sin. It's true that when Paul sends a letter to the Ephesians, he probably did not know he was writing down Scripture, but it doesn't matter. He was writing down Scripture because all Scripture is breathed out and inspired by God. In every case, God was the true author, not Moses, not David, or Isaiah, or Matthew, or Paul. God breathed out His holy word. I like this quote from Adrian Rogers, the great Southern Baptist pastor from Tennessee. He said, you can trust the Bible. Truth comes from God. You can trust the Bible, he said. You will never be a great Christian until you come to the unshakable conviction that the Bible is the Word of God. I think that quote is so good it bears repeat. You will never be a great Christian. Here's a question for you. Do you want to be a great Christian? I don't mean famous. I don't mean renowned. I don't mean looked up to. I mean as you stand before God, do you want to be great in His sight? This is what Adrian Rogers says, and I believe him. You will never be like that. You will never be a great Christian until you come to the unshakable conviction that the Bible is the very word of God. This, this week, the children will be challenged to believe that their, that their, their Bibles are reliable. Our children are being attacked on all sides. Satan is still asking the question... Has God said husbands must love their wives? Has God said wives must submit to their husbands? Has God said children must obey their parents? Yes, the Bible still says all of these things, and the world is attacking them through Satan. The world, the flesh, and the devil. You know what our kids need? Our, need, our kids need parents and grandparents aunts and uncles and mentors who are great Christians. They have come to the unshakable conviction that the Bible is the Word of God. And when they have a question about what's going on in the world, the first 
answer is not, well, let's Google it. The first answer is, let's see what God has to say about it. I have another question for you, and that's this. Have you believed the central message of the Bible? Have you come to this shakable, unshakable conviction that the Bible is the Word of God? You know, the central message of the Bible is that we need Jesus. That we are lost. I was talking with the kids last night, the ones that we have, Satan and uh, Satan, Satan the Malachi. Oh, I'm not edit that one out, Rebecca. Um, Salem and Malachi are in uh, Utah, this um, family. Extended family, sort of. And um, I was having a little devotion with the younger three, and we were talking about how you get saved, how you come to know Christ. The ABCs, they had forgotten it from last year's vacation Bible school, so we went over it again. The first one is A, admit to God that you're a sinner and repent. B, believe that Jesus is the Son of God. C, confess your faith in Jesus. That is the central message of the Bible. A.W. Tozer said, The Bible was not written for our information, but for our transformation. I love that. Somebody put it on a mug. Too often we think, Oh, that was a good sermon, or that was a good lesson, or I enjoyed that reading. And it fills up our minds, and then we put it away, and we don't put it into practice. But that's not what Jesus said a good Christian does. The Christ, Jesus said the wise man is the one who hears the words and then does them. And that's what you and I must do. Not just be informed, but transform. I hope today that you are. Let us pray. Father, our earnest plea for this week.